Today uh, marks a lot of things. One, it's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers out there today, and um, not just to our mothers, but to those who raised us. Uh, you know, we I, there was a joke at my house when I was growing up that um, my mother was uh, the mother to Anthony and to Joseph, but also to all the, the brats that Anthony and Joseph brought into our house to sleep over, right? Um, I've got about six or eight friends uh, from growing up from middle school and high school that uh, would crash at our house all the time. And my mom would make sure and feed them all and she would make sure and deal with all their problems and all their issues and, um, you know, all that stuff. So uh, we, we are thankful to all those who raised us. Uh, and <laughs> I had several of those myself, a lot of my friends' moms that uh, were there for me whenever I was going and trashing their house, right? <laughs> That's the way it worked. Uh, so we are thankful for our mothers. Uh, I, I began to think this week, um, God's been doing a lot in, in my life this week. Uh, first, we, uh, we, we, I, I slept about five minutes from the church last night because I got keys to a new place. And so I no longer have to drive 45 minutes to church. Like it's, it's amazing. Like God opened that door. Um, I was also late for the first time since I've been here today. <laughs> it was that, you know, uh, Chris and I were, um, were, were waking up, and it was like, we got, we got some extra time. We got plenty of time today. We are so close to the church. And then we come in here sideways as we were getting in here. So um, we are. But seeing how the Lord has just opened those doors and allowed uh, that to happen in my life. And then I began thinking this week, um, I like to go one more step. So I want to encourage you today, before I jump into the message, I want to encourage you to go one more step. Because here's what happens in my life that I notice. I will experience God in, in that first initial step, and it's awesome. And then I've realized most Christians, they settle for that. You come into a worship service, you get moved, and you, you experience this glory and this goodness, and then you, you walk away and you say, that was great. And then you go about your daily life. Maybe you jump into the Bible and, and you see something cool or neat, or you experience God in a cool way, and you allow that to be your experience. I'm going to encourage you today, go one more step, because here's what's happened in my life this week. I could have said the Lord provided me a place to live that's now close to my work, and that's, honestly, it was a move of God. Like, I can go back and tell you the story, that's for another day, another time, and I can show you how God put steps together, like crazy answers to crazy prayers. I mean, I was like, Lord, I want you to give me somebody that does this for a living, that also knows somebody that does this for, like, we walked through it, and God did all of it. Like, it was nuts. I could have let that be my experience this week. But instead, I said, God, I see that experience, and I want to worship you for it. But I know you're still working even beyond this one little path that got me here. So let me see another thing, Lord, that you're doing. Let me experience something else. And here's what I began to, to realize. I got greedy, okay? I got greedy by saying, God, I want to see more. I, want, I just want to see more. I want to see more of you, not more things. I want to see more of you. I want to see your hand working in more areas in more lives. And so what happened? I, every day this week, I can show you things that I got to see God do, not me, not anything I was doing, not anything I received, but all these things God was doing. I began to, it's almost like I can walk up, you can tell me about three or four minutes of your week, and I can point out where God's doing something. Like it was crazy this week. It was wild. And I began, because part of it is because we're starting a new series today called Behold, and it's all about the King of Glory. It's all about the King of Glory. There is nothing else this is about. It is just the King of Glory. When I was working alongside our staff a couple of months ago asking about each of the major days on the church calendar, right? I was like, Mother's Day. It's like, what kind of message do we do on Mother's Day? And the staff was like, well, I mean, you can, you know, shout out to mothers. You know, if there's some places in Scripture for mothers, you know, how do you... And I thought, how do we honor mothers the most? What can we do to honor mothers just the absolute most? And what we came up with was, let's just put on full display the king of glory. How about we just do that for mothers? So mothers, this is your honor today. We're going to do our best to put on full display the king of glory. Because here's what I've learned. I could give you a flower, but that flower is going to die. I can give you a great memory, but that memory will fade away. I can introduce you to the king of glory in all of his splendor and all of his might, and your life is changed forever, forever. I'm telling you, God is working. He's doing things all over the place. I, I'm so thankful um, 
that he is that he is always at work. Uh, I wanted to give you just a little um, a little bit of information before we jump in today. Um, first off, I want to say thank you to Pastor Charles. Uh, he is he is stepping into all kinds of roles. I wish you could step into our staff meeting. And listen, as all these tasks get laid out, and it's like, well, who does this belong to? Well, that's actually Charles. Well, that's actually Charles. And then this week, he was like, the last few weeks, you know, through this transition of, of worship ministry, Charles, it's like, okay, well, who can take care of worship leading for us? Charles can do that. Charles can do that. Charles can do that. He's texting me now at midnight every night, and he's like, hey, I'm trying to work on this registration thing. Can you help me with it? It's like, poor guy. I want to thank him for that. But I also want to say, as a, as a piece of information, I love Charles. I love his voice. I said, it, it's so frustrating to me, this big giant of a man who can bench press 400 pounds. Y'all, he can bench press 400 pounds. And he gets up and sings, and it's like this smooth, like, sweet voice. I'm like, that's, that's just wrong. That's wrong. I don't like him for that. But I, I love him singing. I love his family singing and, and the, the team leading. But um, I, I do want to say this next week, this coming week, um, we're actually going to bring in a, a new uh, candidate for worship pastor. And so he will actually be uh, here this Wednesday morning for our Wednesday morning Bible study. Um, it's this young man that the Lord has been bringing up. You know, I tell you, the Lord's been working and he's been doing things uh, for several months now. We've been talking about this potential transition of this worship ministry here at New Providence. And I've been praying and the Lord's been, guess what? The Lord is not surprised about anything. Let me tell you, he is not surprised. He was working, li listen, if you want to go really far back, he was working 25 years ago when my family moved here. I did not know, I, I, listen, I tried my best to move out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the Lord's like, oh, no, 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 I've got a plan. We're working things together. So this week, uh, I, I think that you will see how God is working together this process and this plan uh, for a next level for our worship ministry here. Um, so I want to encourage you this uh, Wednesday morning, if you're in our Bible study, you'll get to hear our uh, uh, this new guy and uh, hear him lead worship in that day. Uh, him and his wife will be here. Uh, and then next Sunday morning, they will lead us in worship. And then they'll lead then the next Wednesday and then the next Sunday, which is like Memorial Day weekend. And then the church will, at the end of that service, uh, that Sunday morning, we'll, we'll get together and, and vote to affirm that this is our guy. Um, so it's somebody we'll, we'll all agree on in the spirit. Um, but I know that these next couple of weeks are going to be fun and exciting. And again, part of this, like, I want to do my best to, to just uh, worship the Lord in this. Because again, he is the one that is orchestrating and writing all the stories. It's him. We're just having to make sure that we're reading the right one, right? He's writing the story. We need to read his story and not the world's story. We need to read his story and no one else's. Today, uh, we're, we're going to jump into Psalm chapter 8. If you've got a copy of God's Word, I encourage you to jump into Psalm chapter number 8 with me. Um, this is a, a message. We're just going to go through this Psalm, each of these verses. And as we look through these nine verses today, I hope that we can experience... Um, a little bit of, of the glory of God. We're Today the message is titled Mighty and Mindful. Each of these behold messages uh, for the next four weeks are all uh, in the Psalms, by the way. So we're going to be in the Psalms a little bit. And the hope is that we can see the glory of God. That's the hope. That's that's the bottom line hope. I don't, I don't have any other agenda through this. I don't have any other plan for this. I just want to let God, let God be God. Okay, I'm going to try to get out of his way. And then we're going to see him and experience him for the glory of who he is. All through the scripture, we see these terms, behold. What behold means is capture with your eye and don't let it leave. That's what behold means. Capture it all in, take it all in, and don't let it leave your sight. If we can live our lives and not lose sight of the king of kings, you will make an impact in this world that will be lasting, outlasting your life. It will last for generations upon generations. If you can just behold the king of glory. So today, uh, we're going to look in Psalm chapter number 8. Uh, this is a psalm of David, great, wise David, King David, this wonderful guy who is um, uh, the man after God's own heart. And the psalms, by the way, if you're looking for a place to know how to communicate with God, go to the psalms. The Psalms are all communications with God, to God, about God, for God, all of those things. This is, this is David communicating uh, in how we should connect with our God in heaven. So Psalm chapter 8, um, 
before we uh, uh, jump in there, I want to read uh, one verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible says, None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's, that's what the, the, as Paul is writing to the church of Corinth, he says, listen, the reason Jesus was crucified is because the ones that were in charge didn't know who he was. They did not recognize the Lord of glory. That word Lord means supreme authority. Everything belongs to him. They didn't realize the one they were crucifying, he made them. They, and, and, and the word glory there is this outshining, beautiful, incredible uh, 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 display of his holiness. So the one who created them, they turned around and crucified. The Bible says if they would have recognized him, they would not have done the awful acts to him. That's, that's just bottom line truth. Of course you wouldn't, right? Oh, you're the one who made me. You're the one who designed me. You're the one who's been chasing after my heart. How dare you? I'm going to murder you. That's not how that works, right? You are thankful in this. So I do not want us to be caught of the sin of not recognizing the Lord of glory. So in Psalm chapter number 8, beginning at verse number 1, the Bible says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. I love this uh, phrase, this, this first verse, because it gives us a powerful statement to begin. O Lord. That word Lord is the word Yahweh, the word of God in the Old Testament, the name of God, which means the self-existing eternal one. So when, when David begins writing, he says, O self-existing eternal God, the one who is our Lord. He says, O Lord, our Lord. Those two word lords are different words in the Hebrew language. That first Lord is Yahweh, one that is self-existent and eternal. That second word, Lord, is the word for the, uh, that gives us the understanding of he is the master and the king. So here's what David is saying. O oh, self-existing eternal one who is our king. There is no question that he made it all and now we serve him. He is Lord of all. He is the supreme authority in charge of everything in our lives. Then he says how majestic or how glorious, how famous is your name or your renown, your fame, who you are. People know who you are because of your glory, because that you are king, because you are the self-existent eternal one. Everyone knows who you are in all the earth. Now, before we get too far into this, I want to give you a little truth today. Uh, I want to give you a lot of truth today. Uh, first truth is this. Right now, the name Yahweh, the name of God, the self-existent, eternal one, the one we pray to, our Father in heaven, he, his, his glory right now is, is shaded by sin, right? The sin around the, the world. Uh, his name is not famous, quote unquote, we we'll use his name is uh, um, uh, majestic, his glory in all the earth. Um, and when it says that is right now, there are other things that are competing for glory that are distracting people away, distracting humanity away from the glory of God right now. But as I've said before, and as I will say till I die, there is a day coming where all of those competing glories are going to get stomped out and it is going to be nothing but the glory of the king. That day is coming. So this psalm gives us a few things. It gives us, one, a little bit of a what they call a messianic psalm, meaning it's pointing to Christ. Another, it's a little bit of a prophetic psalm, meaning it's talking about things that are to come. And then it's talking about the connection between us and God. So it's a connector psalm. This is a powerful, great place to read in the scripture. So he says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then verse number two, uh, it, it continues on. You've set your glory above the heavens. First off, we, um, we look at the heavens, and the heavens are what we can see from the atmosphere, right? So you look up at night, and you see the stars. You look up in the day, and you see the clouds and the beautiful blue sky, and, you look, and we think, man, the glory of God is awesome. But here's what David says. Your glory is set above that. We can't even see it. We can't even experience the full glory of God in this moment because he set his glory above 
where we can even see. Like, that's how powerful and amazing he is. So what does it say next? So next it says, you out of the mouth of babies, verse number two, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Here's something I want us all to understand today. God does not need a multitude of armies to take down anything. He doesn't. In fact, I think of, uh, I, I think, I go back through the Old Testament, I think of young little Moses. You guys remember Moses, right? Little baby, put him in a basket. You know what I'm talking about? Then set him in, in, in a river. First off, like, not the best parenting move. There's been times, right, whenever your baby's crying enough, all of us have wanted to set our baby in a basket and put him down the river, right? That's not, that's not what was happening. So, so Moses is this little baby, and Moses' mother, see, I, I told you I'd bring it down around to mothers today. <laughs> Moses' mother did a godly thing by sending her baby away. <laughs> no, um, she did a godly thing by listening to the Lord, and she, she put her baby wrapped up in this little uh, cocoon type thing, put, her, put him in a basket, and sent him in the river. And then, and then she sent someone to go and watch, right? I want to watch and see what happens to baby Moses. My guess is the mother said to the person that was watching, she said, listen, if the baby ends up in trouble, you go get the baby and bring the baby back to me, right? I'm, gonna, I'm the mom here, like take care of the baby. Baby Moses is floating in the river, and all the while, the most powerful man on the planet, this man by the name of Pharaoh, he is, he is, he's got all of the children of Egypt in, uh, in, in, in slavery. He owns God's people. God says, I own my people. No one else owns my people. Right? So this little baby Moses is floating along the river. Pharaoh's daughter comes down, and as she sees, and, and here's, here's, here's what happens. I just I picture it in my head. Okay, if I'm wrong, then then you can leave it out. I think that as as baby Moses is floating along, baby Moses has cried and he's got these tears down his cheeks. And I think that that Pharaoh's daughter sees the tear on the on the cheek of that little infant, and that tear destroyed the entire nation of Egypt. <laughs> you know why? Because God doesn't need an army. God doesn't need a, a, a slew of angels to come and wipe away the people uh, that, are, that are oppressing and, and, and have absolutely torn up the nation of God. God says, all I need is a tear on a baby's face, and I will take down the most powerful nation in the world, the most powerful man in the world. That's what I'm going to do. So that tear from that little baby, the Pharaoh's daughter, was her heart was wrenched. She gets him and she raises him. And the next thing you know, you can keep reading in the book, the book of Exodus, beautiful place to read. You can see how that little baby grew up to be the one who would take, and, and listen, Pharaoh was destroyed. He drowned. Like that's, that's what's going on. Like God says, all I need is a baby. You say, well, that's, that's one instance, Anthony. Go and read 1 Samuel. See, when Samuel gets born and what happens in his life and his story, he's born, and next thing you know, he's the one that anointed King David, who's the one that wrote this. How awesome is God? He's like, a baby can change everything, and I can use a baby. I can use an infant. I don't have to have big multiple armies. David says, the fact that you can use an infant and destroy the enemy is beyond my understanding. That's what he's saying. He's, listen, you, out of the mouth of babies and infants, I can almost picture David as he's writing this, and the Holy Spirit saying, write this down. Because I remember seeing whenever baby Moses was floating in the river, he got to where he was just in front of Pharaoh's daughter, and then he let out a little cry out of the mouth of an infant, and the most powerful nation in the world destroyed. Like, that's how God works. I don't know. I just think it's crazy. I think it's awesome. Anyway, he goes on. He says in verse number three, When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. That verse uh, helps me to see. I, I've always been kind of a, kind of a, maybe a weirdo. I don't know. Uh, I love to go out and look at stars. I love doing that. I like to look at the moon and the stars, and, and at night, on a clear night, like you can just stand me, see me standing outside, just head straight up, just looking, you know. People driving by the house, and I'm just looking. They're like, was he okay? Oh, I think he's, he's worshiping right now. This is what my worship stance looks like. Like, that's it. Because I just cannot get my mind around the fact that these little twinkling lights are really balls of fire out in the universe that would burn me, right? The sun is a star. It's 90 million miles away, 
And I'm pretty sure the 11 minutes I was standing out holding a sign burned this bald head. I'm pretty sure. These are powerful, powerful balls of gas that are out there, and they're just displaying His glory. When you look at the heavens, and then you see, David says, I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers. You know an arm is stronger than a finger, right? And he says, I don't need an arm. It's just some stars. I can just sprinkle them out there with my fingers. That's how powerful this God is. And as I'm looking at that and seeing that, and then he's, I, I read a quote this past week from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He says, if the stars came out only once in a century, people would stay up all night gazing at them all over the world. Think about that. If, if the night sky was only available to see one time in your lifetime, all of planet Earth would not sleep at all that night. You can, I want you to go out. I hope it's a clear night tonight. Lord, let it be a clear night. I hope, I hope it's a clear night. You can go out and look at the stars tonight and just take a moment. Don't just glance out and be like, oh, the stars are pretty tonight, and then move on. That's what we do, right? We're like, oh, the stars are beautiful. I see constellations. I see all of it. It's so pretty. It's so nice. Go out and really take a gaze and really see because that's just God's fingertips at work. That's just him saying, I'm doing this because I'm so glorious. I'm just going to let other people experience it by just looking up. That's what I'm going to do. I, I began to think about uh, when David wrote this, he obviously didn't know um, all the facts and information we know now, right? We're so smart. We're so smart. Smartest we've ever been, and yet acting the dumbest we've ever acted, okay? It was, that's the way we are today. And here's what I realized. The Milky Way galaxy, they say, is uh, they, they've measured the size of it. That's the galaxy we live in, right? Our little planet. Now, we don't live in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. I know we all think everything is, is centered around us, right? Each one of us in this room, at some point in our lives, maybe today, we think the world revolves around us. Listen, our world doesn't even revolve around the middle of the world. So, like, that's not even where we are. But where the Earth, we live in our little neighborhood called the Milky Way galaxy, it's 100,000 light years wide. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away, right, from one end to the other, no problem. Well, we think, oh, well, how big is 100,000 light years? Because I start saying those things, and our number's just like, oh, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> no big deal. If I want to travel over there, take me a weekend, right? Actually, if you traveled as fast as the speed of light, so I did all this research. I looked at the speed of light travels in a constant state 186,000 miles per second. All right. That means you can get around the entire world seven and a half times in one second. I would have loved to have that speed being late this morning to church. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I'd have been here on time then because I left right at time it starts. So 186,000 miles per second. If you were to travel that fast, that's seven and a half times around the planet in one second, like a second, right? Seven and a half times already all the way around the planet. If you can travel that fast, it would take you 100,000 years to go from one end of the Milky Way galaxy to the other. 100,000 years traveling that fast. We, let, me, let me tell you, when, when David's looking up and he's writing this psalm, I want you to think about that for just a moment. 100,000 years traveling at 186,000 miles per second. That's how long it would take you to get from one end of our neck of the woods to the other. Not counting the other billions of galaxies out there. Who do we think we are? Like, this is our God. He, and he just sprinkles it with his fingers. And then the next verse, the next thing says, verse 4, What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. <laughs> Here's what happens. So as I was just explaining, the speed of light and the, length, the size of our galaxy, and by the way, that's not our solar system, right? We have our solar system. We're like, we're, we're you know, third or fourth in line for that. You know, we're not even anything big in that. Like we, we are, we, we see the bigness of who God is and what will happen. And almost every time I'm up staring at the, scar, at the star, at stars, you know, like this, if you ever drive past and you're just like seeing the pastor out there doing that, Here's what's going to happen next. As I'm looking at the vast universe, from my little perspective, by the way, from my little spot on the earth, as I'm looking up and seeing all of that, there is a point in my life that I will start to tear up and I'll say, what, what, 
you know me? Like you recognize and know my name? You put fingerprints on me that you gave to no one else? What? What is man that you are mindful of him? That first word man is the word Enosh. That word Enosh means weak person. It says, what is this weak person that you're mindful of him? Why would you even think about me? You've got all this power. He breathed and stars just showed up. You realize if our sun goes out, we're toast. That was from the lungs of God is where that was from. David, as he's writing this down, he says, all of this beauty, all of this majesty, everything that I have ever seen, and you have a mind to think about me? This weak man? And then he says, the son of man. Listen, there's two words here. Again, for man, that first word is Enosh. What is Enosh that you are mindful of? What is this weak man that can't, by the way, I can't create anything. You give me long enough, I'll make you a birdhouse and it'll probably fall apart. I can't create anything. And this God says, I'm going to create all of these things and it's not even hard for me. This is just the work of my fingers. My, my lungs breathed out all of this universe, my fingers moved them around and set them in place, and I am thinking about you. So David says, what is this weak man that you've thought about me? And then he says, the son of man, that word is the word Adam, it's the word for Adam, and it means the man born of the earth, that you would care for me. Here's, here's what David's saying. He says, listen, God, I'm seeing this. You are mighty. So mighty, I can't mess with you. I don't know why anybody would. I don't know why anybody would refuse you working. I don't know why anything would ever happen. You breathe this stuff, you, you scatter it out with your fingertips, and then you think about this weak vessel. You think about us. And then he says, this weak vessel, and then he goes a step further, born of this earth. Like, I want you to think about, there's other planets out there, guys. There's other things out there. He says, listen, I'm born of this one little spot. And you... You care for me? You, you actually care and love me? I don't understand. I'm, I'm looking at your glory and I'm getting a, a, a snippet of it. I'm getting a two-sentence two word from it and I can't get past it that you think about me. How is that even possible? And then and, and even in this time, listen, here's what was so great. Whenever David wrote this psalm, there was, um, there's, there's a principle that was going around the world at the time of a religion of the Mesopotamians. The Mesopotamians believed that the, the gods, little g gods, false gods, gods that are not our God, the Mesopotamians believed that the gods created man because the gods would get tired of work. So they created man so that man could do all the hard work so the gods could relax. So the only reason that man was made in Mesopotamian gods the only reason, the only purpose of life was to take care of the gods that made them. That's what, that's what the prevailing religion was in Mesopotamia. So here's what David says. My God with his fingers made everything. It was not work. It was not hard. He did not create me to take care of the stuff that he couldn't cre take care of. He created me to love me. He created me and cares for me. So when David's writing this, I want you to think about this. How stirred up, this is where, this is where you got to take one more step, right? Think about it. Uh, how stirred up were the people of Mesopotamia when he wrote, oh no, my God didn't need me for anything. My God just created me because he loves me. Now what happens is humanity has been raised. Listen to what the next verse says. The next verse says, verse number five, Yet you have made him a little lower, man, mankind, right? The sons of Adam, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Here's what David is saying. We, weak men, born of Adam here on this earth, we have nothing to offer. All of Mesopotamia, yeah, they say that all the people were created so that they could 
basically be slaves to their gods forever and just do the work that the gods couldn't do. Yet you have made us, our God, Yahweh, our Lord, our God, majestic is his name in all the earth. When he created me, he didn't create me because he couldn't take care of stuff. He created me and then he crowned me with dignity and with honor. He made us a little lower than the heavenly beings. That word heavenly beings is Lohim, which is where it derives from Elohim, the name of God. So here's what David is saying to us and, and, and for us so that we can understand. God created us a little lower than the heavenly beings. If you are in school, if you are in the education system here on this planet, what they will say is, you have been a little higher than the crawling things. They will say evolutionary process has brought you from the fact that you were this single-celled little thing and now you've just, you've just barely graduated over the things that crawl on the earth. Let me tell you something. It's a lie from hell. That's not what we are. David tells us and reminds us, this God who made it all has created us. We're just a little lower than the heavenly beings. We're not just a little higher than the animals. We are just a little lower than this. Don't ever think you're not a big deal. Because you are, because you're created in, guess what? The image of God himself. How in the world does this great God say, I'm going to create man, I'm going to create them in my image so that they can have dignity and honor and enjoy my creation. That's what God thinks of us. It says in verse 6, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. See, the gods of Mesopotamia said, you're here so that you can work so that what the God owns, what the gods own, you can, you can just basically slave away at it. Here's what God says. I'm going to give you dominion and power and authority over what I've created. He didn't say I was going to subdue you and make you under that. He says, I'm going to let, I'm going to let you be over all of this creation because I love you and I trust you and I've made you in my image and I've called you to a high standard of life. It says verse number 7, all the sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds, verse number 8, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Here's what the author is telling us. He says, you, you made all this, and then you made us. And then instead of saying, I'm going to make you slaves to all this, you said, I'm going to make you kings to all this, give you dominion and authority over creation. All the animals will listen to you. All of the livestock listen to you. You have authority over them. There is no animal that has authority over man. It's not the way the order works. It's all man has authority over all the creatures that crawl on the earth, that are in the sea. I love how verse number 8 says, whatever passes along the paths of the sea, that phrase literally means the channels that are within the sea. Now here, here's something weird. I did a little research. I looked it up. Did you know currents in the seas were not fully discovered until 1847? That's just a few years ago. That's it. By some guy, his name is Matthew Maury. He's noted as being called the pathfinder of the sea. He's the one that went through all of his instruments, through all of the channels, through all the... He figured out that there were currents in the sea. There were paths in the sea. David wrote about it 3,000 years ago. That's how good this book is. Let me tell you, if you're looking for an answer to something, open it up. Read it. It's all in here. The paths to the sea. And then we're like, oh, in 1847, hey, this guy, we got, I mean, this guy, how do I know this guy's name? He didn't discover it. He didn't discover it. Listen, David discovered it. How? With all of his great instruments and all his great... No. The Holy Spirit of God said to him as he wrote this, listen, I've even created channels in the sea. They'll find a, Everybody else will find out about it 3,000 years from now. But I'm going to tell you early. I, I want to be the one on the early list, right? People probably thought, David, you're crazy. Paths to the sea. What does that even mean? I don't know. God told me there was paths in the sea. Okay, whatever. Then we find out 3,000 years later, hey guys, did you all know there's paths in the sea? Then everybody's like, what? No way. It's like, well, it was in the book 3,000 years ago. That's when it was written down. We should take some notes. I love this psalm for this reason. As it ends, as it closes, here's what David is saying. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Then he says in verse number 9, as, it, as this goes, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
You know, that's how the psalm began. This is what they call an envelope psalm, meaning it starts and ends with the same, same thought, same phrase. Because here's what David wants us to know. As he was writing this down, beautiful form of poetry, um, it's, it's a form of song. And what that means is, we have started here, and now we've ended where we started again. Because here's what he says. Through this, through this uh, purpose, the way he wrote this, he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then he gives all these reasons why his name is majestic. And then he ends it. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Which means to us, if you didn't get it, start back over. If you didn't see it, read it again. If you didn't get it this time, read it again. We, 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 cut, we keep coming to the end. And then what happens is you get into this circle and you don't even realize where you started and where you're ending. You're like, wait, am I starting it again or am I ending it again? I don't know. It's just all, in, it's all encompassing. I'll tell you what happens. People say to me all the time, how do, you, how do you get this stuff out of the scripture? How do you read this? How do you understand this? How do you share things? Part of it, I believe, is a spiritual gift. The other part of it is a lot of study, a lot of reading. Like you all think, oh, he just opens the Bible and it jumps off the page. You, what you see, the result you get is like 60 hours of study. No joke. For just about every sermon. Like hours and hours and hours. And you say, oh, well, he just, he just picks it right up off the page. No, what happens is I get to Psalms like this. I read it and I say, okay, oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And the next thing you know, I'm like, okay, is that the end or the beginning? So I read it again. And I read it again. And I take notes as I read it. And I read it again. And I take more notes. And I read it again. And then I say, okay, he's talking about going out and looking at the heavens. So I'm going to wait for a clear night. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to look at the heavens. And I'm going to see what the heavens really look like. And as I'm standing there staring up at the, at the sky on a beautiful night, I'm like, the moon looks different than it did yesterday. The moon looks different than it did a week ago. The moon looks different. How is this? Wait, this stuff is moving. This stuff is shifting. Oh, that's because the earth is moving. Oh, my goodness, the earth is moving? Are you telling me we're on an axis? We're even on a tilt? We're moving so fast that if it were to stop, I'd fling off. Are you kidding me right now? All of this is going on. It's continual. So listen, when I come to worship, when I come to our gathering together, i got a lot filled up in me. Like a lot, a lot. Some of you are like, I know, you go a little too long, right? But here's the deal. I, I can't get enough of this. As David is writing this psalm, it's a short little nine-verse psalm, eight different verses, number nine and number one, repeat. And here's what I've learned. He just says, this is who this God is. He's mighty, he's powerful, he's awesome, and he's mindful of you. That should change our life. Are you walking around like someone who is known by the one who created everything? You know, sometimes I think that we get kind of obsessed with, with uh, uh, strong people, influential people, wealthy people. You know, uh, and part of it is like we want people to know who we know, right? You ever been around name droppers? If you're like, no, I've never been around a name dropper, then you're the name dropper. You know, people around... It's like, oh, yeah, I know so-and-so from, you know, back in, we went to school together, or, oh, yeah, I know this person, and all this stuff. Well, it's different whenever you know somebody, right? But it's different when somebody knows you, right? When you're the name being dropped. It's like, oh, okay, no big deal. My name gets dropped. Now, my name gets dropped as the pastor of New Providence, probably not in all the best ways. You know, it's like, have you seen that new pastor? Yeah, oh, ugh. You know, there's that. It's like talk, people talking about me. But here's what I've learned. If someone that you know knows you well and you're friends with them and they're of influence, let's say I knew a celebrity, okay, and I, that, I brought that celebrity in, everybody's like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I'm going to say, yeah, no big deal, we hang out all the time, right? Why? Because I'm trying to show you that I know somebody important. And more than that, I'm trying to show you that this important person likes me enough to hang out with me. That's a big deal. David says, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have made everything. Your glory is on display. It's not even, and what we see is just a glimpse of the glory because your glory is set above the heavens. It's set beyond where our mind can even go. You see all of this. All of this was made by your fingers and you just moved it around. You breathed and all of this happened. All of these things. And yet, you know me and you care for me. Let me encourage you today. Be, know that you are cared for by the one who made it all. You want to talk about a name to drop? That's the name. The name that's above every name. You can name any celebrity you want. Their name is underneath Jesus' name. 
It's, it doesn't matter who they are. You can name anything in this world. Their name is under Jesus' name because His name is the highest. It's above all things. That's who this God is. As He finishes it and He says it again, Lord, oh Lord, if you're in, in case you're still wondering, by the time you get to the end of this psalm, he says this, in case you're still wondering how majestic of the name of the Lord our God is, then let's sing it again until you behold it. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, in this place, uh, Lord, I, I just want to thank you for, for being God, for being strong, being mighty, being powerful, being amazing and wonderful. And Lord, I just uh, I cannot help but think and imagine and know that you, as mighty as you are, are mindful of us. Lord, you've set us just below the heavenly beings. And yet the world keeps telling us, oh, no, 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 know your place. You are set just above the crawling things. Lord, if not for anything else, may today we understand what we are in your eyes. We are loved by you. We are cared for by you. You loved us so much, God, that whenever we sinned and fell short of your glory, you sent your son Jesus. He gave his life so that we could be in your family. God, that's a love I will not, I cannot wrap my mind around. But then I go out and look at your heavens and I can't wrap, can't wrap my mind around that either. So Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope and pray, God, my prayer through this whole series, through today, through this moment, through everything, God, is that we would behold the King of glory. Let us know how great you are and let us know how much you love us. We thank you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us. This thank you for joining us online today. We hope you enjoyed the worship experience. If you want to get connected to our church family, the easiest way to do that is to text the word welcome to the number on the screen. That will put you into our text messaging service, which you will be able to get information about our church family and ways you can connect. If at any point during the message today, you felt a stirring or a prompting that you had questions and want to know more information, you can also, after you are a part of our text messaging service, you can just text that number and ask anything and it will come to our pastors. We can pray with you if you have a prayer request or whatever you may need. We invite you to come and join us in person. We would love to meet you face to face and see how we can serve your family within this community.